أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم يا أيها المدثر كن فأنذر وربك فكبر وثيابك فتحر والرجز فهجر ولا تمن تستكثر ولربك فاصبر Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, O thou wrapped up in a mantle, arise and deliver thy warning, and thy Lord do thou magnify. And thy garments keep free from stain, and all abominations shun, nor expect in giving any increase for thyself, but for thy Lord's cause be patient and constant. Assalamu alaikum. Welcome to another edition of Islam for Europeans. Uh, it's good to be back after a long delay. Sorry for not creating a video in a while, but I wanted to create a video about this amazing book uh, recommended to me by my good friend, uh, Abdul Rahman at Knowledge North. Uh, and it is called uh, The Spread of Islam in the World, A History of, uh, of Peaceful Preaching. Uh, this book was written in 18, uh, first written in 1896 uh, by a gentleman named Sir Thomas Walker Arnold. Okay, and... Uh, Yes, uh, Sir, Thomas Wa Sir Thomas Walker uh, Arnold uh, was a teacher at the anglo Mohammedan College uh, in Alagar, India, uh, which was, the f uh, I think, one of the first, if not the first, uh, English-speaking uh, um, Islamic schools in British India, uh, which was first established by Sir Syed Ahmed Khan. Um, and it is a very uh, interesting account of, the, of how... Uh, the religion of Islam spread uh, from the Prophet's time, peace be upon him, all the way up until uh, you know the, uh, the 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 late 19th century, and it goes through uh, first uh, the, the uh, preaching and the uh, the the, pe the period of the Sira, uh, which the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, uh, spread the message of Islam in Mecca and his companions, and the incredible difficulties faced there. Uh, to uh, the propagation of the faith when you know, he made Hijra to Medina, uh, and then finally uh, with the uh, with the conquest of of, of Mecca, Feth Mecca, um, and then it goes into each chapter is like a different uh, I guess geographical region, um, not necessarily based on on time, uh, but it really goes into great detail and gives a rich uh, history of how uh, Islam spread throughout the world. And it really breaks down a lot of uh, misconceptions um, and also introduces a lot of ideas that were really lost uh, when people think of Islamic history um, and just how, um, you know, the position of Islam in, uh, today, uh, you know, vis-a-vis -vis the West. Um, you know, there are so many um, misconceptions um, and, uh, and myths, uh, both on the far left and on the far right as well. Um, that this book, you know, sort of eloquently just breaks apart because the research done in this book must have taken a very long time. Um, you know, the, the, uh, Tom, uh, Sir Arnold must have gone through a lot of different books and materials um, and primary sources, which he cites, uh, you know, to, uh, to document all these things that went on in, uh, in Muslim history. Uh, so let's get into it. Um, yeah, so, you know, I'm going to give a read, a read out a few passages um, but in general, um, you know, many of the myths that it deconstructs, you know, um, I guess from the anti-Islam right is that, you know, um, that Islam was spread by the sword um, to the point that uh, people were forced to convert to, to Islam en masse. And what I like about this book is that uh, while uh, Thomas um, acknowledges that there were uh, instances in which uh, people were uh, forced to convert to Islam. Uh, this was not uh, the, 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 you know, the, 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 the majority of what happened throughout history. Um, so these events were isolated. Um, and when people were you know, forced to convert to Islam, um, you know, the, the, the effects were very uh, pretty much counterproductive or completely ineffectual. Um, the, the main conduit in which uh, more people were drawn into the religion of Islam uh, was missionary work, um, you know, throughout the Muslim world, um, and you know, and, and birth rates, of course. Uh, but yeah, for the most part, it was people accepting Islam because it, they um, they found it to be a very clear doctrine, um, you know, a very rational doctrine, 
um, and a way to invite uh, you know human beings uh, to the religion of their creator uh, in which they could communicate and ask for forgiveness directly from their creator at any time a and also this sense of, 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 of pure brotherhood uh, in which they were immediately you know became uh, equals uh, with their co-religionists right so uh, it goes into detail into detail about that um, you know, in even 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 aside from forced conversion, when um, when Muslims, you know, who were maybe were uneducated in their faith, went to drastic measures that were beyond uh, the Sharia or you know incredibly harsh, um, you know, this was not a good method of keeping uh, Muslims in the fold uh, to begin with. Um, yeah, so for the the overall majority, it was very uh, you know very peaceful uh, preaching that went on in the Muslim world. Um, yeah, so it gets into uh, after you know the after Fath Mecca, um, the next chapter is on uh, I guess the spread of Islam in Western Asia, um, where especially with um, with Khalif uh, Khalif um, Omar uh, who uh, did the conquest uh, in you know in what is now present day uh, uh, Syria and Lebanon, Bilad Sham. Um, and you know it, it, the 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 people of the book, uh, the Vimy, uh, the Christians and the Jews, uh, and, and people who just you know weren't Muslim, you know they had protection of their faith. Uh, they were not forced to convert to Islam. Um, they were pra they were free to practice their religion. Um, and the only thing that they had to do was pay the capitation tax or the or the jizya. And that's another thing that a lot of the anti-Islam uh, right they mention it, but they don't. Um, you know, this book really goes into detail into why it was actually a fair practice because A, um, you know, for starters, uh, non-Muslims do not have to pay zakat, right? So Muslims, uh, we have to pay zakat. It's one of the five pillars of Islam. And that's 2.5% of our um, annual um, uh, net income, right? If you want to give more, you can give more, that's fine. Uh, and that is on both men and women. Right, you have to make a certain amount before you actually pay it, but that 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 is the 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 tax that the Muslims have to pay. So non-Muslims do not have to pay this tax, right? So in lieu of the zakat, there is the jizya, but the jizya uh, is in return for protection from the Muslim army um, and uh, exemption from military service, right? And they actually give instances in this book where uh, non-Muslims who decided to participate in the uh, in the Muslim army uh, to defend the land. Uh, they were exempted from the jizya, right? So, um, and then on top of that, only able-bodied men uh, were charged the jizya, uh, which means that women were not charged, uh, the clergy was not charged, uh, the sick, the elderly, uh, very young. These people were not charged because they were not able-bodied men, right? So, and then I didn't know this. Um, I actually didn't know this, but this book goes into detail about the, basically there were three gradations of, of the jizya. Because I always want to know what, what the percentage was uh, compared to the, the, the zakat, which is 2.5%. So I guess you could say the upper class, like the you know the the uh, the wealthy, um, I said it was 48 dinars uh, per year. Uh, for the middle class, like the you know the the the, the, the merchant class, the um, uh, apprentices, you know like uh, blacksmiths and things, they, you know you know they it was 24 uh, 24 dinars per year. And for the working class, it was 12 dinars per, per year. And for the poor, they didn't have to pay anything. Okay, so um, it goes into detail about that. Uh, you know, and uh, there was one instance in which um, uh, Umar, an, there was a village that, he, that they could not protect anymore because the pagans were kind of overwhelming uh, certain areas of the, of, of, uh, that were under Muslim control. And what he did was he returned the jizya uh, as a trust to the non-Muslims there. Uh, with the message basically that he was not able to protect them uh, as he prom as they promised, and they were not sure if the pagans were going to overtake uh, that particular city, uh, so he gave them back the jizya because you know, I can't defend you. you know, in the event that we are able to, you know, we would ask for it back, but if not, then you can keep it. Uh, so yeah, so it, it goes into detail about that, uh, and then it goes into Spain. Uh, so it goes into um, uh, Andalusia. Uh, and you know the the Muslim world there, um, 
And it was, uh, you know, again, the Christians or the Jews, they were able to practice their religion freely. Uh, they did not forbid them from basically anything from practicing in their religion, um, using usage of the censers uh, or the bells, um, the religious Christian ceremonies. Um, but uh, the thing was the way that Islam spread uh, in Andalusia it was basically many, many people native to Spain converting to Islam. Right. And I actually didn't know. So this when I read this, it actually it just it just knocked me out of my chair because, you know, it just shatters both uh, the arguments from both the anti-Islam right um, and the woke left at the same time. Because, you know, when we think of Andalusia, we think, you know, that they, they, it was basically at that point more ruled by the Muslims uh, until 1492 when you had the Inquisition of Ferdinand and Isabella. And, you know, the Muslim population was exiled uh, into the uh, into the Arab world, right? But what but they don't tell you is that the overwhelming majority of the Muslims who were in Spain at that time were actually native Europeans. So these were Spaniards who had actually converted to Islam. So it goes into detail here. I'm just going to read this off. Uh, what deep roots Islam had struck in the hearts of the Spanish people may be judged from the fact that when the last remnant of the Moriscos uh, was expelled from Spain in 1610. These unfortunate people still clung to the faith of their fathers, although for more than a century they had been forced to outwardly conform to the Christian religion. And in spite of the emigrations that had taken place uh, since the fall of Grenada, nearly 500,000 are said to have been expelled at that time. Whole towns and villages were deserted and the houses fell into ruins, there being no one to rebuild them. These Moriscos were probably... Uh, were probably... Uh, all descendants of the original original inhabitants of the country, with little or no admixture of Arab blood. The reasons that may be uh, adduced in support of this statement are too lengthy to be given here. One point only in the evidence may be mentioned derived from a letter written in 1311, in which it is stated that of the 200,000 Mohammedans, they say Mohammedans, they really mean Muslims, uh, then living in the city of Grenada, not more than 500 were of Arab descent all the rest being descendants of converted Spaniards. Finally, it is of interest to note that even up to the last days of its power in Spain, Islam won converts to the faith. Uh, for the historian, when writing of the events that occurred in the year 1499, seven years after the fall of Grenada, draws attention to the fact that among the Moors were a few Christians who had lately embraced the faith of the Prophet. Right. So th this is something they don't tell you um, in a lot of uh, history class. And it's something that Muslims don't mention. They actually they, they should really, because, you know, uh, part of the whole problem of giving Dawah in the West is that there really is no, especially in Europe proper, there's no real positive European Muslim identity. Right. Um, but, you know, if they were to mention this very simple fact that, you know, th most of the Muslims themselves in Andalusia were uh, people who are native to Spain who converted themselves, um, you know, this would be counter to that. You know, when we think of native European Muslims, we think of Bosnia, we think of Albania, you know, we think of parts of Russia, um, you know, but until I read this book, I had no idea uh, that there were so many uh, native Spaniards who had converted to, 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 to Islam, right? So the anti-Islam, right, their, their, you know, their common argument against Islam is that, you know, you know, they were trying to take over Europe and, you know, um, you know, they wanted to, you know, get rid of uh, Christianity and ins institute Sharia law. Um, so, you know, and this is the type of rhetoric that Zamur is using in France, you know, so we need to get rid of Islam if you want to keep, you know, the our, our European culture. When in actuality, I mean, these, you know, these people, they kept their culture. They were still identifiably Spanish. Um, you know, they were just Muslims. Right. Like this, this author right here could tell the difference between Arab uh, Muslims who were living in Spain and you know the Moriscos who were who were also uh, Muslim as well. So I find that interesting to point out. Um, and that argument also crushes the idea of the woke left. You know that you know we shouldn't give dawah to to white people um, that they're irredeemably evil um, and that they shouldn't convert to Islam en masse. I mean it wasn't like you know the native Spaniards who converted to Islam started attacking other Muslims. I mean they're living side by side with the with the with the Arab Muslims. So I just I found that really interesting, um, you know. Uh, so yeah, the, that was really cool. Uh, yeah, there's also little accounts here and there of also other, um, you know, European pop uh, European groups that have converted to Islam. 
that uh, you know are comp you don't really see anymore. Like for example, um, there's this one account of um, of a Muslim who was um, actually in um, Aleppo in Syria. He said that I met a large number of persons called Bashkirs with reddish hair and reddish faces. They were studying law according to the school of Abu Hanifa. May God be well pleased with them. I asked one of them who seemed to be an intelligent fellow for information concerning their country and their condition. He told me, our country is situated on the other side of Constantinople in a kingdom of a people of the Franks called the Hungarians. We are Muslims, subject of their king, and live on the border of his territory, occupying about 30 villages, which are almost like small towns. But the king of the Hungarians does not allow us to build walls around any of them, lest we should revolt against him. We are situated in the midst of Christian countries, having the land of the Slavs on the north, uh, on the south, that of the Pope, i.e. Rome. Now the Pope is the head of the Franks, the vicar of the Messiah in their eyes, like the commander of the faithful in the eyes of the Muslims. Uh, his, authority, his authority extends over all matters connected with religion among the whole of them. On the west, Andalusia. On the east, the land of the Greeks, Constantinople, and its provinces. He added, our language is the language of the Franks. We dress after their fashion. We serve with them in the army, and we join them in attacking all their enemies, because they only go to war with the enemies of Islam. I then asked him how it was they had adopted Islam in spite of their dwelling in the midst of the unbelievers. He answered, I have heard several of our forefathers say that a long time ago, seven Muslims came from Bulgaria and settled among us. In kindly fashion, they pointed out to us the errors and directed us into the right way, the faith of Islam. Then God guided us and, praise be to God, we all became Muslims and God opened our hearts to the faith. We have come to this country to study law. When we return to our land, the people will do us honor and put us in charge of their religious affairs. Islam kept its ground among the Bashkirs of Hungary until 1340, when King Charles Robert compelled all of his subjects that they were not yet Christians uh, that were not yet Christians to embrace the Christian faith or quit the country. Okay, so again, destroying the the anti-Islam right narrative uh, that you know um, you know Islam is not part of Europe and we need to get it out of there and it's 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 terrible uh, for the continent. I mean, these these were Muslims living with uh, you know um, you know under the the uh, the the rule of Hungary. You know, the king of Hungary was allowing them to stay there uh, to practice the religion of Islam. Um, and then, you know, once King Charles Robert uh, came in, he basically forced them to convert to Christianity or leave uh, Europe altogether. Right. So we see uh, among, I guess, the anti-Islam right, uh, this this idea that, you know, like we need to get Islam out of Europe when in, in actuality, you know, it's just um, it's just doing nothing but you know destruction for Europe. And, you know, and again, it's just reinforcing the Hegelian dialect. I mean, this is it no, no doubt inflames tensions in the Muslim world towards uh, towards Europe and vice versa. Okay, so uh, that's another interesting thing. Um, oh, and another thing, you know, as I mentioned before, and uh, the Muslims who were living there in Hungary, they kept all of their dress, they kept the language, they spoke the language of the Franks. Um, you know, so it wasn't, it showed perfectly that Islam um, is not culturally predatory. You can keep all of these things, right? Things that are, you know, important to your uh, to your culture, uh, and Islam actually encourages that, right? And here's another perfect example. It talks about um, Muslims on the island of Crete. Uh, I didn't actually know this that, that Crete actually had a large Muslim population. As you know, Crete um, is an island that's part of Greece now. Um, the Turkish conquest seems to uh, have been very rapidly followed by the conversion of large numbers of the Cretans uh, to Islam. It is not improbable that the same patriotism has made them cling to their old faith under the foreign domination of the Venetians who kept them at arm's length and regarded any attempt at assimilation as an unpardonable unpardon indignity and always tried to impress on their subjects a sense of their inferiority may have led them to accept the religion of their new masters which at once raised them from the position of subjects to that of equals and gave them a share in the political life and government of their country. Whatever may have been the causes of the widespread conversion of the Cretans, it seems almost incredible that violence should have changed the religion of a people who had for centuries before clung firmly to their old faith, despite the persecution of a hostile and a foreign creed. 
Whatever may have been the means by which the ranks of Islam were filled, 30 years after the conquest, we are told that the majority of the Muslims were renegades or the children of renegades. And in little more than a century, half of the population of Crete had become Mohammedan. From one end of the island to the other, not only in the towns, but also in the villages, in the island districts, inland districts, and in the very heart of the mountains, were and are still found Cretan Muslims, who in figure, habits, and speech are thoroughly Greek. There has never been, and to the present day there is not, any other language spoken on the island of Crete except Greek. Even the few Turks to be found here had to, adapt, uh, had to adopt uh, the language of the country, and all the firmans of the port and decrees of the pashas were read and published in Greek. The bitter feelings between Christians and Mohammedans of Crete that may have made the history of this island during the 19th century so sad a one was by no, ne no means so virulent before the outbreak of the Greek Revolution, in days when the Cretan Muslims were very generally in the habit of taking as their wives Christian maidens, the children of their Christian friends. The social communication between the two communities was further signified by their common dress, as the Cretans of both creeds dressed so much alike that the distinction was not even recognized by the residents of long-standing or by Greeks of the neighboring islands. Recent political events have brought about a considerable diminution in the Mohammedan population of Crete. In 1881, the number of Mohammedans in the island was 73,234. In 1909, in consequence of continual emigrations, it had been reduced to 33,496. Okay, so another example uh, of the anti-Islam right, uh, you know, uh, making it more difficult uh, for European descendant Muslims. And, you know, hopefully a lot of this information will clear so many misconceptions and, you know, uh, I guess change the game. Because if you look at, you know, the, the Muslims there, I mean, uh, even the, the, the Ottoman Turks, you know, they were, they, they actually translated all the edicts that they had to, to give and all the information they had to give into Greek. So uh, that's how much they wanted them to preserve uh, their culture and language. Okay. And again, this is in line with the, the Quranic uh, ayah. Um, you can read it. It's uh, Surah 30, Surah al Um And among his signs is the creation of the heavens and the earth and the differences in your languages and your colors. Okay. Uh, yeah, I mean, there's also... <laughs> I also wanted to point out something pretty humorous. There's some really funny passages in this book. I mean, I, this one had me rolling on the floor. See, a lot of these anecdotes are just so, I mean, this book is just so, it's so fun to read just because not only does it, um, you know, give, create such a great, great images in your head, but it also, I guess, shows that it, the spread of Islam throughout the world was not, you know, contrary to proper belief. You know, they weren't exactly, you know, um, you know, these puritanical it wasn't a purified version of islam at all times i mean they did things wrong they were imperfect i mean they believed things that were you know that would i guess take them outside the fold of islam sometimes but i mean people are human and you know they make mistakes and i think this is an example of that in the chapter of the, the spread of islam in india uh they give an account of um one of the, a lot of the story of the india like they're kind of like fantastical and they sort of like they turn into like kind of like these folk stories that are just kind of just impossible to believe. So one of the earliest of these, they're talking about actual Dais in India, was Sheikh Jalal ad-Din Tabarizi. And this was in the Bengal, uh, who died in A.D. 1244. He was a pupil of the great saint Shihab al-Din uh, Suhradi. Um, in the course of his missionary journeys, he visited Bengal, where a shrine to which is attached a rich endowment was erected in his honor, the real site of his tomb being unknown. Many miracles are ascribed to him, among others, that he converted a Hindu milkman to Islam by a single look. <laughs> so <laughs> I, just, I couldn't stop laughing when I read that. So um, I don't know. Maybe it's true. I mean, maybe the guy was just so compelling in giving dawah that he just had to look at the guy and he converted to Islam. But again, I mean, you have to believe Islam in your heart. I mean, um, yeah. But um, yeah, I mean, that, that just found a funny anecdote. Uh, continuing on, um, yeah, so another, you know, m misconception or myth that, you know, the anti-Islam right gives, um, you know, I guess you can call this kind of the Molunian argument, because Stefan Molin always, always used to, you know, kind of, they kind of combine what happens in, you know, Africa and, you know, uh, parts of Asia, um, you know, countries that are not as well developed as, you know, the West or Japan, 
and they kind of mix in these arguments with Islam itself. So they conflate, you know, underdevelopment of certain parts in the in the world uh, with Islam itself, right? But here we read, you know, from you know a, a European uh, writer himself, and you know um, Thomas actually uh, quotes him uh, that the Muslim areas in Africa were far far greater developed than the pagan areas of Africa, right? So I'm just going to read through here. Um, do apologize, you know, for the language. Again, this was written in 1896, so there's some antiquated terms that may be considered racist, but I'm just reading this verbatim. So, uh, What the civilization of Muslim Africa implies to the Negro convert is admirably expressed in the following words. Quote, The worst evils which there is reason to believe prevailed at one time over the whole of Africa and which are still to be found in many parts of it, and those too not far from the Gold Coast and from our own settlements, cannibalism and human sacrifice and the burial of living infants disappear uh, at once and forever natives who have hitherto lived in a state of nakedness or nearly so begin to dress and that neatly natives who have never washed before begin to wash and that frequently for ablutions are commanded in the sacred law and it is an ordinance which does not involve too severe a strain on their natural instincts the tribal organization tends to give place to something which has a wider basis in other words, tribes coalesce into nations, and with the increase of energy and intelligence, nations into empires. Many such instances could be adduced from the history of, of the Sudan and the adjoining countries during the last hundred years. If the warlike spirit is thus stimulated, the centers from which war springs are fewer in number and further apart. War is better organized and is under some form of restraint. Quarrels are not picked for nothing. There is less indiscriminate plundering and greater security for property and life. Elementary schools, like those described by Mungo Park a century ago, spring up, and even if they only teach their scholars to recite the Quran, they are worth something in themselves, and may be a step to much more. The well-built and neatly kept mosque, with its call to prayer repeated five times a day, its Mecca-pointing niche, its imam and its weekly uh, service, becomes the center of the village instead of the ghastly fetish or juju house. The worship of one God, omnipotent, omnipresent, omniscient, and compassionate, is an immeasurable advance upon anything which the native has been taught to worship before. The Arabic language in which the Muslim scriptures are always written is a language of extraordinary uh, copiousness and beauty. Once learned, it becomes a lingua franca to the tribes of half the continent and serves as an introduction to literature, or rather, it is a literature in itself. It substitutes, moreover, a written code of law for the arbitrary caprice of a chieftain, a change which is, in itself, an immense advance in civilization. Manufacturers and commerce spring up, not the dumb trading or the elementary bartering of raw products, which we know from Herodotus to have existed from the earliest times in Africa, nor the cowrie shells or gunpowder or tobacco or rum, which still serve as a chief medium of exchange all on the coast but manufacturers involving considerable skill and a commerce which is elaborately organized. And under their influence, and that of the more settled government which Islam brings in its train, there have arisen those great cities of Negro land, whose very existence, when they were first described by European travelers, could not be but half discredited. I am far from saying that the religion is the sole cause of all this comparative prosperity. I only say it is consistent with it, and it encourages it. Climactic conditions and various other influences cooperate towards the result. But what has pagan Africa, even where the conditions are very similar, to compare with it? As regards the individual, it is admitted on all hands that Islam gives to its new Negro converts an energy, a dignity, a self-reliance, and a self-respect, which is all too rarely found in their pagan or Christian fellow countrymen. Right? So, again, destroying the myth that... Uh, that that Islam was was a negative influence on Africa or Asia. Um, again, we can see here civilization. You know, um, you know, Islam encourages. You know, it just creates an entire civilization based around the lingua franca. In this case, Arabic. Um, and you know, you can see even here, even with European writers, you know, who may be racist in their writings, you know, they they thoroughly admit that Islam created prosperity for uh, for the areas that were Muslim. Right. So. Um, yeah, and another actually another point that you know may be very controversial is that um, paradoxically, 
um, when we saw, okay, in the night, because this was written in 1896. So in the colonial era, um, you know, we had in several areas the abolishment of the slave trade. And many times in, in these areas that were, that were colonized, um, they, they could only hire Muslims to fill these posts, right? So a lot of the, you know, the European powers, they, the you know, Mohammedans were the most, uh, Mohammedans, Muslims were the most educated by far. Right. So, you know, and this actually helped the spread, the vast spread of Islam. Right. So the uh, further the suppression of the slave trade has removed one of the great obstacles to the spread of Islam in pagan Africa, because it was to the interest of the Arab and other Mohammedan slave dealers, uh, slave dealers, not to narrow the field of their operations by admitting their possible victims into the Brotherhood of Islam. Converts are now one from pagan tribes in which the days of the slave trade were untouched by missionary effort. To this result, the European governments have contributed by employing Mohammedans to fill the subordinate posts in the civil administration, since among the Mohammedans alone were educated persons to be found, and distributing them throughout pagan districts by employing Mohammedan teachers in the government schools and by recruiting their armies from among the Mohammedan tribes. They have thus added to the prestige of Islam in the eyes of the pagan Africans, a circumstance that the Muslims have not been slow to make use of to the advantage of their own faith. So again, it was the Muslims themselves who were in these positions who took advantage and you could see that Islam spread very quickly uh, to places they never thought would be able to, to go to. SubhanAllah. Uh, yeah, so um, I guess one more point to add before I conclude. Um, I guess the main conclusion that uh, Thomas comes to in this book, and again, this book is really hard to find. I mean, this book really needs to be reissued. I mean, it is difficult to buy, uh, you know, with shipping hand and cost like 30 bucks. Um, it should honestly, it should be in every library. It should be in every Islamic bookstore. That's a great resource. Um, but yeah, just to conclude, uh, Thomas he gives his conclusion in that um, the spread of Islam, you know, throughout those centuries, um, the reason why it was more successful um, than the Christian missionaries is that, you know, for the Christian missionaries at large, they had a hierarchical hierarchical you know, group of, of, of Christian missionaries. So they were trained. Uh, you had the priestly caste. So it was basically, you know, like they had a different hierarchy of people giving dawah or, you know, um, calling people to Christianity. You know, Christian mission, this was not reserved for the, you know, the, the, the Christian lay person, you know, whether that's coming from Europe or whether that's an actual, you know, Christian convert, um, you know, in, in the East or in Africa, you know. So by contrast, Islam, you know, it, um, you know, like the, the ayat that I quoted, you know, uh, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala commanded Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam to rise up and proclaim. All right. So that right there means that is that dawah, that the propagation of the faith of Islam is incumbent upon every believer, you know. Um, and this is what we saw throughout the Muslim world, even though there was really no hierarchical caste um, or specified groups. Uh, that actually gave you know dawah it was you know much more uh, unorganized than the christian missionaries the muslims were far more successful just because you know they took this they had a very um you know every person who you know the believer was basically you know giving dawah on you know uh to his own community and to the people around him right um it was a much more dynamic a much more quick uh you know a much more accessible approach to islam Right. And um, we see this, too. You know, you know, the, the t uh, Thomas talks about Islam in the Malay archipelago. And, you know, a lot of these are just just few simple traders who, you know, who traded goods, uh, you know, or businessmen um, and women. Um, and, you know, they brought Islam to the people directly. They didn't need to consult like a priestly caste um, or, you know, go take a top down approach um, in calling people to Islam. And I think this is why. You know, we saw such a great spread of Islam, uh, but really, sadly, now, in the, especially in the 21st century, um, that has kind of been lost, sadly. I mean, a lot of people are afraid to give dawah. They're afraid to preach the religion of Islam um, because they believe that this is something reserved for the YouTubers, um, for the people who have studied Islam their whole lives. And they're afraid of making a mistake, really. Um and it's really sad. I mean, also, you know, you have Muslims who don't feel comfortable kind of giving dawah um, in, in non-Muslim countries. Um, you know, so hopefully, you know, one of the lessons we can take from this book is that, you know, um, because Islam is so dynamic, 
and because it, it you know it um, encourages and enjoins the you know believing Muslim you know to give this faith to the people and I say this first and foremost for myself I mean I, I need to do a better job of you know giving dawah to my community but you know my I guess my, the, the conclusion that Thomas is making is you know if if you're Muslim I mean you know be proud of who you are um, and don't feel reluctant in talking to people about uh, Islam itself and you know I guess we, if we can go back to this dynamic approach of you know not being afraid to talk about Islam for fear of making a mistake um, you know I think the harm outweighs the good so so I went on for a while um, you know thank you so much for your patience I know it's been a while since I created a video um, I do have some big news coming up um, I'm not gonna uh, say it um, publicly yet uh, but do stay tuned for that um, and hopefully inshallah I'll be able to create more interviews um, in the in the coming weeks and also uh, more videos at large so uh, please subscribe to Islam for Europeans. Thank you so much um, uh, for your time today. My name is Robert. Uh, Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuhu.